It will be derelict if we are not. And so last Sunday morning, the first Sunday of 2020, I began to set forth a 2020 vision for the new year. Turn in your Bibles, please, to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 11 to 22. 2 Chronicles chapter 11, 7, pardon me, verses 11 to 22. And stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read these verses. It's a familiar passage, particularly 2 Chronicles 7, 14. shows up in a lot of different places, a lot of different settings. It gets a lot of different comments from some pastors who want to make this the be-all, end-all, the, the verse for America, other pastors who say this has nothing to do with America. I reject both of those notions. Follow along as I read this passage. If you don't have your Bible with you, we'll put the text on the screen. The context, remember, is that Solomon had built the temple and the royal palace according as God had instructed him. And he dedicated it with prayer. And that's in chapter 6, 1 through chapter 7, verse 10. In verse 11, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house, and all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house, that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you, and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne as I covenanted with David your father, saying, You shall not lack a man to rule Israel. But if you turn aside and forsake my statutes and my commandments that I've set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will pluck you up from my land that I've given you and this house that I've consecrated for my name. And I will cast you cast out of my sight, and I will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And at this house, which was exalted, everyone passing by will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? And then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers who brought them out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them, and served them. Therefore he has brought all this disaster on them. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to see, to take this passage which was spoken to Israel upon the completion of the temple in Jerusalem and make a gospel application of this to our day. We, the local body of believers, we who are the temple of the living God, and help us to see that, that warnings, blessings, promises, curses apply 
in new covenant settings in terms of whether or not the Lord will have his eyes open to us when we pray and hear us when we pray and bless us or whether he will take his hand off of us as a church, as a people, as a nation. Thank you. Please be seated. America has squandered the goodness of God in more ways than we can enumerate today. In fact, I'll be honest with you. When I read how God treated nations in the past and how even today some come under judgment, I am amazed every morning that this nation does not fall under the staggering judgment of God. In the culture, nearly everything the Lord says is right is considered wrong. The idea that men shall lead is misogynistic now. It's all about white supremacy, patriarchy, men dominating women. Any suggestion that the gospel has a standard for male and female is now assaulted as homophobic, as mean, as cruel. Leaders in evangelical circles. The president of the Southern Baptist Convention today says that we should show gender hospitality. And when a person who is a biological male says to you, that he wants to be known as she, or shim, or z, or whatever nonsense. He says we should show them gender hospitality and call them by their gender. Participate in the assault upon the Creator who in the beginning made them male and female. The head of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention has just said recently, we need to recognize the common ground we have with Islam. Brothers and sisters, the secular culture is going down the toilet as fast as it can. Someone said to me last week, you got kind of political, didn't you? you could, if you want to say that, that's fine. But when, a, when an entire political party stands for everything that, that God says is wrong and they say, no, it is right, then someone needs to say something about that. Let God be true, and everyone who opposes God marked out as a liar and a servant of Satan. What do you expect it from the culture? When unbelievers act like unbelievers, it shouldn't surprise us. It may dismay us to which they're willing to go to assault our God and His Son and His Word to trample on our heritage here in this country, which was a nation founded under God, but, but it sh shouldn't surprise us. But when within the church, you say, okay, well, the Methodist church is going to split. They've decided to split over the gay and lesbian issue and the gay marriage issue rather than go to what the Word of God says. You expect better from the church. And then when our own Southern Baptist Zion has leaders rising up to speak nonsense. And we as a people need to stop and say, what in the world has happened? And what must we do? What kind of men and, win, men and women do we need to be in times like this? And that's why, as I've thought about this, I told you Karen and I attended a... a introduction meeting back in November of the group America Praise. And the group Oklahoma Praise was there joining together a nationwide effort calling upon Christians to pray. We must cultivate a culture of prayer here. And I want you to know God being our helper Karen and I are going to be engaged 
in helping cultivate a culture of prayer here. But I can't make you do that. But what I hope to do is set before you what the Scripture says should be true and is true and ought to be acted upon and what is happening all around us far away and near. And maybe God will provoke all of us to say that with God's help, I need to be a part of that too. What I hope comes out of this is that we as a congregation will select, I figure given our size, probably select a half day a month and notify the America Praise and Oklahoma Praise organization and say you can count on us to be standing in the gap to intercede. Brothers and sisters, if we can't get on board with this, then I don't know why we even think we have a right to exist. The mark that Saul of Tarsus had been converted to Christianity was identified when the Spirit said to Cornelius, Behold, he's praying. So I told you last week, and it's going to real quickly, ref that, that the year was 959 B.C. at the end of, of the six-year period. Solomon had finished the temple and finished the palace, and brought the Ark of the Covenant into uh, the holiest place, that visible picture of the presence of God. We asked you last week, what... What was the prayer the Lord heard? And that's what we looked at last week. And then what was the promise the Lord made? We want to look at that today. And what should we learn from this as we face 2020 and the future beyond that? Of course, the, the prayer that the Lord heard, I told you, I showed you in Second Chronicles 6, beginning in verse 1, we cited some emphases in verse 20. He says that your eyes may be open and that you may listen. The idea, I don't, it probably doesn't even pass through our minds. Do you realize? Well, just because we pray doesn't mean that God is willing to hear. He is not the celestial candy dispenser. Solomon understood, and we should too, that when we pray, we need to pray in the name of the Lord, but all that that means coming before Him recognizing our need to be cleansed, our need to repent, our need to humble ourselves. And, and, oh dear God, look. Open your eyes to us. Don't shut your eyes to us. Don't turn your deaf ears because we know you can. And we know that sometimes you should. And it's almost at this point, folks, in our, in our country, when to suggest that God bless America is taking His name in vain. America seems to want to stand for everything that is ungodly. And we as people must stand in the gap and make our voice clear. So he says over and over, 21, listen to the pleas. When you hear, forgive. He contemplates people sinning against one another and he says in verse 23, hear from heaven and act. Verse 24, when they've sinned against you. Verse 25, hear from heaven and forgive the sin. Verse 26, when they've sinned against you. Verse 27, hear in heaven and forgive the sin. Verse 30, hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive. Verse 33, hear from heaven your dwelling place and do. Verse 35, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause. We're going to recognize Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. Next Sunday, you're going to hear me say then that the leading cause of death in the world is abortion. 42 million babies executed in their mother's womb in 2019. That Planned Parenthood, contrary to everything it publicizes, had a record number of abortions performed this year under their oversight with government money. 
plead their cause. Verse 39, hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive. And in verse 40, having appealed these several times, said, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer of this place. Let your priests be clothed with salvation, the message of the gospel. Because this is all about the gospel. And he says, let, you, let the saints rejoice in your goodness. Do not turn away your, the face of your anointed one. And so we, we saw that last week. And I want us to think about today. What was the promise the Lord made? Well, it's in our text that I read earlier. 2 Chronicles 7, 11 and following. Look at verse 12. The Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. Now, we don't deal in buildings, okay? God's blessed us with a building. We, the new covenant says that we're the spiritual temple. The Holy Spirit indwells us. But He's given us a place to meet, which we should greatly appreciate. When our brothers and sisters in Christ in China are watching their church buildings be destroyed, when the Chinese government has decided they're going to rewrite the Bible, it's going to be the only authorized version that can be used in China, and it's going to talk about how the communist government is the right way. When our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Middle East must hide to worship, we ought to say, Dear God, anoint our gatherings. Look down from heaven and see when we come together as a people that we come together recognizing You've given us this place. We dedicate it to You for praise, for worship, for preaching, for teaching, for prayer. Brothers and sisters, that means that we, He needs to find us here when these times are dedicated for that. And so He says, I've heard your prayer. I've chosen this place. If we want to see spiritual awakening in this country, and we haven't had a spiritual awakening since the 19th century, this if you're, if you're a student of that sort of thing the way I am, it grieves me. 1700s, the downpour we call the First Great Awakening. The 1800s, the downpour we call the Second Great Awakening. The 1900s, the Jesus movement in the 70s. Not a Great Awakening. 20th century came and went without a downpour. I tell you, it ought to break our hearts. We come into 2020. Now 20 years into the to the 21st century, we, we ought to say, Dear God, we cannot live. We cannot go on without another awakening. And if you want that, if you desire that, if you see the need for that, then you ought to give yourself to that and say, you can count on me to be found when and where I need to be found in the hope that God will be pleased to use this as a flashpoint. He says, I've heard. Verse 14, after having said in verse 13, not if, but when I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain. Command the locusts to devour the land. Send pestilence. We may not be dealing with drought. We may not be dealing with, with our crops being devoured by the locusts or a pestilence following that. But brothers and sisters in Christ, it doesn't take a first-ranked theologian to recognize that God is not pleased with America. He is not pleased with a country that arguably, other than the nation of Israel in its history, the country that's the most blessed nation on the face of the earth, not because we are the new Israel, but because God has simply been pleased to be merciful to us, and to whom much is given, much will be required. And the Scripture says judgment will begin at the house of God. We may want judgment to begin in Washington, D.C. We may want it to begin in liberal universities. We may want it to begin in sanctuary cities and, and now in cities that are 
that are going to start confiscating guns. We'd, judgment begins at the house of God. He comes to His people first and says, you have more light. The people that frustrate you in your government and in your culture are groping around like blind men in the dark. You have light. And you're responsible for the light that you have. So after having said He will, when He shuts up heaven, and I submit to you and suggest to you, heaven is shut up to this country right now. Yes, we have trickles of mercy, dew drops of mercy, but the downpour of heaven, the latter rain that we've seen in the first and second great awakening has been shut up for over a century. Now make no mistake about it. Iran is experiencing an awakening like you cannot imagine. Believers are being harvested there. Muslims turning to Christ in record numbers. But that's not happening here. I read where one Muslim commented about the rockets that were shot at our base in Iraq. Their God redirects our rockets. God is doing some great things over in the Middle East. The harvest of souls. We long for that here. We long for God to come in power. And He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. I would submit to you that for me to live on my agenda, ignoring God's agenda, is pride. And for you to live on your agenda, ignoring God's agenda, is pride. And when he says men ought always to pray, when he says that his house is to be called a house of prayer for all the nations, then we ought to stop and ask ourselves, how am I honoring that clear expectation of the God whom I claim sent Jesus Christ to live and die and rise again for my soul and sent His Spirit to bring me into saving faith. How am I responding to that claim? For me to ignore it is pride. Humble themselves. I've got to ask myself, and I hope you'll ask yourself, Lord, where in my life does pride raise its head? Because you say here, we've got to humble ourselves. And Lord, I want you to move. I want to see the downpour. Heaven come down and glory fill our souls. I long to see your churches filled that all the chosen race may with one heart and mind and soul sing sing of the great grace of God. If my people will humble themselves, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, the Scripture says, and He will lift you up. James says God resists the proud. The word there is He declares war on the proud. The Scripture warns that pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit goes before a great fall. It warns that he who thinks he stands erect straight and tall on his own. Take heed lest he fall. Humble themselves and pray. Pray individually. Pray as families. Pray as a church. One of the marks of the New Testament church, Acts 2, 42 and following, is that they continued steadfastly in the prayers they were praying people. You can read in the book of Acts where they were praying and the place where they were praying was shaken. And as they were praying, prison doors were swinging open for those who were, were imprisoned. As they were praying, the church was praying. I told you for 14 years, I want us to be a praying church. If I, if I knew, if you, could, if you would send to me the time and say, Pastor, this is the absolute perfect time. If, if prayer meeting were at this time, people would turn out in, a, in full force. If I knew what that was, brothers and sisters, 
it would be calendared. But I can't make you. It's got to come from the Spirit stirring you. And my question is, why doesn't the Spirit stir us when He clearly says in His Word He expects it? Pray. We can complain. Complain about the way things are in the nation. Complain about this. Complain about that. That's, that grows on Adam's vine. That takes no effort. Doesn't take the Spirit. Doesn't take the new birth. But pray. J.C. Ryle asks in his little booklet, A Call to Prayer, he said, I want to ask you, do you pray? So I'm not asking you, do you say your prayers? I'm asking you, do you pray? One of the Puritans said that prayer is the breath of the Christian. We can no longer, no more live as a Christian without prayer than we can live without a, as a human being without oxygen. And seek my face. What is the prayer? Seek the face of God. That's earnest prayer, folks. That goes way beyond, dear God, bless all the missionaries everywhere. Seek my face. That's earnest prayer. That's coming to the Lord crying out, dear God, have mercy on us. And seek our face. Seek His face turning from our wicked ways. You see, it's earnest prayer. It's, it's repentant prayer. It's con converted prayer. It's, it's not praying to God, clinging to everything that we want in the world. It's, it's empty hand. Lord, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Turn from their wicked ways. We can't make pagans turn from their wicked ways, but we the people of God, saved by grace through faith in Christ, we can turn individually from our wicked ways. Then as a congregation, we can ask, where are we not as a congregation pleasing God? I think you know. I think you know. See, when those, when, when that has been set in motion, when that is the heart desire that works itself out into the life expression, then He says, then I will hear from heaven. We have no reason to believe He'll hear before that. In 1 Peter 3, 1-7, to there's instructions to how wives ought to conduct themselves if they're living with a husband who's disobedient to the Word. And then in verse 7, Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Treat them with respect as weaker vessels, as joint heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. There's, the Scripture teaches you can pray hindered. You can pray unheard. You can pray going through the motions of prayer. He will not hear. Then will I hear from heaven. It ought to be your desire of every child of God sitting here that God hear our prayers and will forgive their sin. You see, we want the land to be healed. We want America to be great like America was great at its founding. When our Puritan forefathers, our pilgrim forefathers, came over here to get away from tyranny, to get away from a monarch who said, this is how you're going to worship, and this is who you're going to worship, and this is how you're going to be able to worship freely the dictates of their conscience, the true and living God. And I promise you, as surely as I'm standing here, the Pilgrim Fathers did not land on Plymouth Rock anticipating how exciting it would be when all the different religions of the world could be worshipped on these shores. They came here to worship the true and living God. The triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The God and Father of Jesus Christ. Anyone who suggests otherwise is lying to you. We want that America to rise again. And yet we're being taught in our seminaries today that that America was made up of slave owners, 
And so people and professors in seminary are asking the question, was Jonathan Edwards even, even saved? He didn't speak out against slavery. Was George Whitfield even saved? Were the founders of the Southern Baptist Convention even saved? Some of them were slave owners. We need the Spirit of God to come mightily upon us and cleanse us. Forgive our sins to repent. God, forgive us of our, of our laziness. Forgive us of thinking that our, our schedule is more important than, than your heart. Our schedule is more important than your ear. Our schedule is more important than your will. Forgive us, Lord. We repent of that. Forgive our sins and heal the land. Now, if you want America to go on just like it's going on, then just go on like you've been going on. But if it's hurting your heart, there is a way out. That's what I want to talk about in the remainder of the time we have. What should we learn from this as we face 2020 and face the future? Well, I want to give you some statistics in Oklahoma. It's where we live. Oklahoma has the most incarcerated, most incarcerated women in the nation. More women are in jail in Oklahoma than any other state in the nation. Oklahoma ranks third in the nation for mental illness. The number of Oklahomans dying from drug overdose exceeds the number of people killed in car accidents every year. Oklahoma's tenth in the nation for deaths by suicide. The state of Oklahoma is ranked first in the nation for the highest amount of opioid addiction. Oklahoma, tenth and the most violent state, the tenth most violent state in the nation. One in four girls have been victims of physical or sexual abuse. One in three girls struggle with an eating disorder. Oklahoma is ranked first in prescription drug abuse. Fourteen years old is the average for the first use of illicit drugs. 23% of 12th graders have used illicit drugs. One in five high school students binge drink. One in four have experimented with drugs. One in five binge drink. Not drink alcohol. Binge drink. That is the state of the state we live in. Is that okay with you? Is Oklahoma okay in these areas? Well, it doesn't have to be that way. We can join together at the challenge you were given in the first video. Become a part of America Praise. Oklahoma Praise. You know I've told you that the, several of the pastors in, in our city, our area, pray every Wednesday morning together. It needs to become more than that. It needs to expand. The churches need to take a sense of ownership and responsibility and say we have no reason to expect God to change what we've just read about until we step forward and lead by praying. Become part of a 24-7 time of prayer. Bathing our city, our state, our nation in prayer. January the 1st, 2017, the pastor whose voice you heard on the video and a group of other pastors launched New Mexico Praise. That same year, in October, they launched America Praise with the goal that of the 400,000 churches in America, a tithe of them, 10%, 40% of the churches in America would join up and participate in a 24-7 prayer vigil for national spiritual awakening. We can be part of the 90% who sit on the sidelines and go about our business because we're too busy. But we can say no. We 
will be a part of the 10%. We will be a part of that tithe. We will be a people who pray. This group, if you wonder about their theological background, is very, it's, it's varied and they've locked in on the Apostles' Creed as the confession of faith to rally around. I believe in the Trinity, the authority and infallibility of God's Word, the virgin birth, sinless life, deity, crucifixion, bodily resurrection of Jesus, salvation only through faith in Christ, the bodily return of Jesus to the earth. What are the values? I think we have the values to put up for you. Seven values. This movement will be Christ-centered, Bible-saturated, love-motivated, discipleship-driven, local church-based, spirit-empowered, unity-focused. Focusing in on those things in that confession in the Apostles' Creed that we believe in together rather than emphasizing the things we might differ on. Well, what is the focus of this movement? I want to give you these pictures here. First of all, pray for unbelievers to be saved. Every one of us in this room knows people who are outside of Jesus Christ. And when you commit to spend a half an hour or so, whatever your block of time is to, to make up the block of time we as a people agree to do, pray for unbelievers by name that God would save them. Pray for a national spiritual awakening. We need a move of God if this nation is to survive. Pray for unity of the church, not only our local body, that we would experience a unity at a level of a purpose and a cause that we've not experienced before, but that we would have a unity across denominational lines in this area. Pray for families. The family is in, is in danger. You can hear that from the statistics I just read to you. Add to that abortion on demand through the full nine months of pregnancy and even after birth, post-birth abortions they're called now. Pray for rec racial reconciliation. We experienced uh, in the previous administration eight years of undoing of progress made in the area of civil rights so that racial hostility is at an all-time high in this country. Pray that the gospel, which is colorblind, will overcome the voices now coming from our own seminaries who say, if you tell me you don't see my blackness, you diminish me. May the gospel be restored. Pray for true biblical racial reconciliation. Six, pray for life to be valued and protected through all stages of life, beginning at conception. In February, we're going to tell you about a movement, a time at the state capitol. We're going to gather Abolition Day. We're praying challenging the legislators, those Baptist, Oklahoma Baptist legislators who said they will stand in the way of Senate Bill 13, which calls for the immediate ab abolition of abortion, for abortion to cease in Oklahoma. And it's Southern Baptist legislators who are standing in the way of that, who said they will not let it come out of committee. We must pray. Pray for local and national government leaders. Well, how do you do this? Well, you adopt a day of prayer. We'll decide on that. Our pastoral ministries team will meet next Sunday afternoon and we'll discuss this get information about where we're headed with this. Appoint a prayer coordinator. I want you right now to start praying about that. For one of you to step forward. And I pray it's somebody that, that isn't already stepping in, in the gap in, in a leadership role. I pray that somebody will say, I, God's put that on my heart. I want to do that. Share the vision. That's what I'm doing today, and I'll do it again. Recruit and follow up. Line people up. Get them in the slots to pray. Encourage that. Provoke that. And then pray. Finally, I want to tell you real quickly what's happened in New Mexico. New Mexico is where this pastor serves who started this movement. Jeremiah 29.7 says, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. 
So these pastors began to pray. New Mexico was ranked 50th in the Family Prosperity Index, 49th in U.S. economy, had the seven, second highest poverty rate in the nation when these pastors began to pray statewide for New Mexico. A state that was facing an unexpected $200 million deficit now, the report is, has a $1.2 billion surplus. According to a report, since the beginning of 2017, when these pastors began to New Mexico is number one in job increases and wage increases. There's a new economic policy, a thriving oil and gas industry. But the turnaround is too drastic to attribute simply to business models alone. Albuquerque was known as the late-term abortion capital of America. Since churches began praying 24-7 for an end to late-term abortion in New Mexico, three abortion clinics have closed. Furthermore, for over two decades, the University of New Mexico Health and Sciences Department conducted research on aborted baby parts. In a remarkable turn of events, the University of New Mexico has now ended the controversial program. Church unity has intensified across New Mexico. The oneness that Jesus prayed for. Compassion from the churches, caring for the poor, for the underserved, is taking hold in an amazing way. Loving communities like they've never been loved before. In 2018, over 100 churches, in, in the June 3rd, 23rd, over 100 churches, nonprofits, businesses, government agencies partnered together to sponsor a convoy of hope and outreach at Albuquerque Convention Center, giving away $1 million worth of goods and services, 80,000 pounds of groceries, 9,900 9, meals, 1,600 gardens in a bag, 3,000 pairs of shoes, 280 haircuts, 465 family portraits to 5,000, more than 5,000 people. And that's continuing. There's things happening in the area of crime as well. They partnered with the Albuquerque Police Department, praying for them, praying for their officers, making crime reduction number one priority. 2018 is the first year in eight years that Albuquerque had an overall decrease in crime. Robbery decreased 36%. Auto theft decreased 10%. Murder decreased 10%. There's a societal transformation taking place in the city of Albuquerque. It all started with people saying, I will pray. We will pray. We're in a battle for the soul nation. And the only way we win this battle is on our knees. I remind you what J. Edwin Orr said, great uh, student of the awakenings. No great spiritual awakening has begun anywhere in the world apart from united prayer. A turnaround can happen by God's grace. And he's told us in the passage we looked at today how it can happen. How we can expect it to happen. The question that remains for all who say that Jesus died and rose again for me, has saved me, has changed me, that now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Will you be part of the turnaround that needs to come?
watch this video with me.